Welcome to the course Culturally Responsive Built Environments. Today we are going to continue from our discussion on the last discussion on timber constructions. And uh, in the last class we have discussed about the various types of timber construction techniques, especially timber as a vernacular building material in the context of European context and especially in the British context where we have discussed about the crutras and different ways of cladding types including the wattle and daub techniques, including the mathematical types and uh, also the renders, different renders we talked about. So um, that is just a kind of understanding from the one perspective and uh, today what I am going to discuss is about my journey and how when I was uh, working in England and how it started with the advanced timber frame technologies and from there how my whole journey has molded and today how from advanced to vernacular and uh, what right now I am working on and uh, so I will give, give, give you a brief uh, discussion on introduction to the advanced timber frame technologies what I have executed in UK and in other places and uh, how some of the questions in my mind which came at that point of time how it led to the long time research and that is where it has shown a direction into the study of vernacular issues. So uh, and later in this lecture we will be covering on our current project especially with the help of my PhD student Naina Singh. We are working on uh, the Uttarakhand disaster recovery areas. So uh, that will be a, a brief insight on timber frame constructions and timber constructions as well. So in somewhere in 2005, I was working as a designer in a Benfield advanced timber frame technologies and this is where my very first interaction with the timber frame because before that I was working in India and I was introduced to the timber frame technologies. It was so fascinating to learn a new technology and, uh, and it's a very fast track uh, position because it was a, a whole factory is there and the whole supply process as well as the manufacturing and the erection systems. So a building starting from A to Z is completely taken up and that is where it's a very holistic understanding of the timber constructions and that is where I have introduced with the TRADA and different regulatory systems and different um, manufacturing processes and not only that there are also issues in how we can reduce the waste and and how we, it can show a direction to the sustainability issues. So uh, while I was working in this uh, place in fact uh, uh, did a couple of projects on the timber frame uh, designs as well as the manufacturing and uh, there is one project where it is a small project um, it was about doing a kind of prototype houses of the United Nations World Tourism Organizations after the Kashmir earthquake and um, when the client was uh, someone from the United Nations and when they were trying to offer for a kind of prototype houses of, uh, which could be repeated. So I was designing that and then they were all manufacturing they were sent back. That was the time I got a question in my mind. I have not visited the site, I have not familiar with what is the site plan and you know what is the site context and how I am able to design the very uniform set of uh, housing uh, solution to a different cultural context. So that is where uh, I started investigating and writing a proposal and that is how I got into the PhD and further my journey has carried on. But nevertheless it is a good start to you know just to think what I am doing. So just to introduce you, uh, first of all uh, much of the literature talks about the timber because there are two versions which you talk in the uh, Asian context. Uh, especially with the kind of um, limited timber resources obviously it has been uh, uh, looking at the kind of why we have to cut down the trees but whereas in uh, the western context timber is uh, one of the uh, abundantly available resource and that is where it is say so it is a naturally renewable resource and over 97 percent of the soft timber used in the UK comes from Europe where the forest area is increasing by the equivalent of 90 
football pitches every hour of day and night. So that is where what you can see here is um, FSC, it's a Forest Stewardship Council. And um, uh, what this symbolizes is how it is properly, whether the timber is coming from a well-managed uh, forest or not. It talks about the logistics and the supply chain phenomenon and it also talks about the both the afforestation and deforestation aspects of it and how we can have a control on the environment. So what does this FSC does? The FSC is it's a label, Forest Stewardship Council label, which guarantees that the trees that are harvested are replaced or allowed to regenerate naturally. So Apart from the trees, you know, there are also other concerns because the moment you are cutting down some trees, obviously it is going to have an impact on the wildlife. Sometimes it is going to create an impact on some very rare spaces. In fact, I was uh, recently in um, Apulikat Lake in somewhere in Tamil Nadu and you know, the birds travel from Canada or migrate for a particular few months you know, just to each a small snake or a leech which is in that water species. The moment if these water uh, systems or these ecosystem degenerates or degrades gradually, then what happens is the migratory patterns disturbs, then obviously there will be a bigger impact in the larger ecosystems and to the human environments. So now because of various deforestation methods, Many of the wild species, they are now coming to the city because their home has been captured. So one has to make sure that you know you don't disturb the wildlife species and their home and their habitat. And it also talks about, FSC talks about the rights of indigenous people use of the forest because it is, they, they are privileged to live in this forest and they have, there are also certain sacred sites and uh, which you have to protect because it could be a waterfall, it could be a memory to a particular community, it could be a certain sacred environment. So uh, this FSC also provides an assurance that future generations will be able to enjoy the benefits of the forest. And wherever the indigenous tribes living in these forests, obviously we should not create any impact on their lives and livelihoods. So the moment a new company is coming and the, uh, so obviously how you can't just send them away uh, by giving some money or anything like that. So basically how you can actually engage them, how you can actually doesn't make any create any impact on their habitat. So this is one thing we have to look at. And the forest owners must also use local workers to run the forest and provide training, safety equipment and a decent salary. So, and again, you can see which are the FSC products. So the obviously the label talks about which are the FSC and which are the non-forest timber, which like for example, you get all the latex gloves and they're all non-forest timber products. Then the first thing we have to do is the choose and use of right timber. The timber use of uh, structural applica applications, first of all, it must be graded and clearly marked to show it complies with the correct standards because in tim in UK we have uh, the British standards so each timber which you are applying for a particular spans is it a particular grade the thorough grade of it and a particular length and uh, what kind of standard it is reflecting and that is where we have to reflect with the span tables. So that is the uh, apt requirement of the building codes and regulations and the load of a member can carry depends on several factors that is the span of the flow, thickness, width and the type of species. If it is an oak or if it is any other uh, species like you no know, any other local trees, so you, the strength varies. Usually the deeper or the wider the section the longer the span. So different species have different strength properties. So one have to be very careful in choosing the timber. For example, you can see here the vast how timber is graded. So now you can see a C16 here, which is C16 grade, and this is called visual strength grading. So normally the trader mark a certification body and it's a British standard, 
which is a standard reference, which is a dry graded and then the company logo and it has a strength and class and a species of it. So, it basically talks about that define, the strength define the size, the type and the number of strength reducing characteristics allowed in each grade. For example, natural futures such as knots, vein, vein is nothing but an uneven edge caused by the reside of a bark. Whereas the slope of a grain, how the slope of the grain you have, plus splits if there is any cracks or splits, shakes, shakes is nothing but a kind of fissure caused by the splitting of wood fibers along the grain. So the other uh, one is by looking at a piece you are grading, the second one is a machine strength grading. So here you can see the M that is what reflects the machine grade. And then for example, I just show you a, a brief classification. One is you have the British Pine, the Spruce, Douglas Fire and Lark and you have the grading rules here and you have the general structural C14, C16, C18, C22, C24, TR26. So like that you have certain strength classes and they are also special structural. So that is how it is classified. And then what we do is like you have the following species like you know the sizes 38 by 97, 47 by 97, 47 by 220. So for instance you can see if you are using 38 by 97, so in fact uh, in C16 clear maximum span you can go for 1.76 whereas in C24 you can go for 2.5. So which means by changing the grade you can go for the bigger lengths. So if you wanted to span 4 meters at 600 mm centers, so which is like let us say this is a 600 centers a flow joist and you could use 38 by 220 C24 instead of 47 by 220. So which means the depth of the timber is changing and if you are changing the grade of the timber. This is how a typical wall section is in the most of the uh, UK in the recent times and this is what you see the timber studs and this is the window sill and you have a 50 mm cavity. The panels, the timber panels are normally external usually we used to follow about 38 by 140 that is the common width and uh, whereas uh, uh, if it is the internal panels 38 by 89 but in 140 you have this which is a kind of 9 mm OSB or reagent strand board and over that you have Tyvek membrane which is a breathable membrane and then you have about 50 mm cavity and then the brick wall continues. So and you have the DPC here. So this is how and in between these panels you have the insulation material as well, thermal insulation. So what uh, one does is um, uh, this will protect from the weather conditions and this is the general makeup of the wall and I just show you a small project how it is done uh, somewhere in Oxford. And generally when the architects gives you the plan, so you actually study the plan and the sections and the elevations and the first thing what we do is normally, so you have um, draw all the sections and elevations, then what we do is we actually break, let us say if this is a wall, this is a wall and this is a window. So what we do is we take from one edge and then we mark into EP1, EP2, EP3. So that works actually you know because we need to give a little buffer place for placing the lintel load uh, two studs or three studs. So at the same time in the corner stud how it works is so you have one panel sits here and another panel sits here and the another turner stud so that we can nail it here. So this is how uh, the panels are done in a kind of cyclic process, right? So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. At the same time, the internals are normally represented by IP 01, 02, like that. So, similarly, the first floor we do. And then, when we draw the sections, the structural engineer also already have mentioned where to keep the beams, right? So when we are, when we know these are the places we need to give the uh, beams or uh, the steel members, steel sections. So one has to really carefully draft with the spacing aspect of the joist as well as 
if there is any other structural considerations we have to give uh, to give support for those structural elements like for example here he mentioned about 140 by 270 glue lamps so obviously we need to the other side of it how we can create a beam and then uh, provide and this particular roof is all basically a kind of cut roof so this is how a joist uh, layout looks like you can see the blue lines here these are the steel sections where the staircase is coming and wherever the uh, complicated areas so that is where the structural engineer has mentioned yeah keep these places here so the moment you are keeping this then obviously at these places you have to give a structural provision with having some more studs under it so this is how uh, another project in Rutland, restoration project, and you have the beam and block foundations uh, over this. Then the first thing what we do is after doing every layout of the manufacturing process, then that goes to the erection team. That is where we get the sole plate layout. So diagonally what we do measure and we make sure that a sole plate layout is made. And then the planners are erected, and this is how you can see there is a stone because it's a restoration project. So there's a uh, there's a context of uh, um, the stone uh, facade is needed. So the, what we did was instead of brick, we kept for a stone, and um, you can see the attic truss. The whole truss is manufactured and sent to the site, and they are erected. And this is how a panels looks like, and uh, the nine mm OSB. oriented strand board and you have the nail plates and this is the panel this is the head binder and then again on the top of the panel so this is how a window is made and this is have the lintels which is resting here and there's any packer material we fill it and whenever there is a load coming up the engineer suggests to have these as per the span tables and then they also how they erect and the roof, they follow the safety aspects as well. So how you can actually go step by step and take put some kind of temporary supports. And uh, this is called bird's mouth. And this is how a wooden deck, 22 mm wooden deck is placed. So this is how uh, a brief introduction of uh, how uh, the timber frame construction is made. It's a prefab kind of thing, everything manufactured in the, si in the factory and sent to the side, they're erected in one, two weeks, three weeks time, and that's it, the end of the project. And then the brickwork comes on. So it's a very quick process. But the only thing is we have to take care of uh, each and every uh, minute details into consideration. So even a two mm uh, mistake happens a bigger cost and time in the site. So now the challenge is can design becomes a challenge for ensuring sustainability? Can we reduce waste by design? As I said, the moment we do any mistake in our drawing, it becomes more waste in the site, it becomes more cost and it becomes more travel time. So obviously this is one important aspect. So can we plan with time and money? And can we deliver aptly on time, especially in the cold countries because of the weather conditions? Uh, how we can actually, uh, how this particular system have to worked out in such a way the whole project management is carried out so that we can deliver it on time. So this was my learning and uh, as I said, by doing these projects I just realized that how, uh, why not these kind of advanced technologies are not taken to the Indian context and the Uttarakhand. So that is where, um, I still haven't found an answer so far, but still I would uh, give you my journey on how uh, right now we are working in Uttarakhand, especially on the hilly areas of Uttarakhand and uh, along with one of my PhD students is also working on disaster affected areas, on, especially she is looking at the indigenous knowledge. So from advanced, I'm taking you to the indigenous systems, how the traditional timber buildings have sustained and what is the present state of it and how people are responding to it. So, so this is in the Himalayan region, the greater and uh, lesser Himalayan region. And this is uh, the site which I'm showing you from the, a couple of sites which we traveled around and there's from ranges from Gangotri Glacier to the Emunotri Glacier. So this one is near Harsil, which is before Gangotri. You have a small hutment site of him, it's a cantonment area as well as a small village. And this is called Baghuri, which is a kind of uh, Butiyong uh, village and uh, it's a tribal village sort of thing. And uh, what you can see is a kind of traditional uh, timber 
construction is a kind of katkuni type of constructions where you have the horizontal members of timber and then intermediate uh, construction intermediate is fill of the stone uh, component so that because being an earthquake prone area this is one of the important traditional constructions which uh, this region has adopted and most of the cases what they do is in the in the bottom uh, they have uh, staples or so for, for as a granary or maybe for uh, the animals uh, to be there and you can see some of the dwellings you have a small little piles and then they are all on the timber frames and being a buddhist society they also have the, the traditional temple looked uh, constructed with the bright colors because of these particular dark um, so much of the winter time, uh, you know, uh, that is one thing. Having a bright colors also give a visual access wherever you are going around near the mountains. You can see that yellowish color or these red and blue. You can see that settlement do existed here. So and that is one of the reason. You know, the, symbolically the colors also talk about the context. So this is how the Buddhist uh, environment, and you can see here the bottom. The ground floor is either it's a shop converted into shops, or sometimes it is meant for cattle. On the first floor, people normally stay. So everything is made of timber. It was all because uh, earlier they used to get their access to the deodar wood. So what? Because in the higher altitudes, accessibility to the deodar is also very one of the prom prominent uh, aspect and. In those days, the skilled labor also talked about, they looked at the kind of decorative aspect of it, they looked at the construction technology and because wood, in wooden houses, what happens in these cold climates, it makes you warm in the winter and it makes you cool in the summer. So, you can see the kind of intricate work which uh, the artisans have made of that times and unfortunately what we see here is uh, uh, many of these houses are still vacant because some of them uh, have migrated and some of them are on a seasonal basis. So you can see the kind of the whole intricate work. Now, what is happening to these kind of settlement? Because this is a kind of transit, it has become a kind of transit settlement because six months they live uh, downhills and six months, uh, six to four months they may not live here because of the harsh winters and uh, because of lack of proper maintenance or any other thing. So many of the villages around this region, they don't live here. So they go to either Uttarkashi area or Duda and they sell there. So in the in the summer time, they do, uh, they put the cattle and sheep. Only one or two people live there just to take care of the village. Otherwise, uh, uh, most of the people migrate to the downside. Now, one of the classic examples, what you can see here is uh, because now earlier the timber was accessible and it is available, it was available and it was accessible to the local communities. But now because of some certain forest regulatory acts, one family could get only one tree. So because of that limitation, so they had a difficulty in constructing the same way which they had. So gradually what they have adopted is a kind of concrete blocks or the brick and concrete work or the AUC blocks. So in that way what you can see is a part of the timber and as well as part of the foreign, I mean the, the usual materials which we use in urban context. So you can see the brick and concrete buildings and adjacent. So how this one house has been modified. On one side you have the traditional and you have the modern but what one you can notice is if you look at the way they are look they are looking at the the sill heights the window heights the roof heights they try they have a sensitivity of how to match even the size and the plan of the rooms according to their context so Similarly here the, the blocks which they have used and the front facade because most of the time this particular place is used mostly for their livelihood activities because they yarn and they do any kind of domestic works, the women will be weaving sweaters, you know. So there are a lot of work which is happening in this area. So even still you can see and some of these timber houses they resisted many earthquakes. So this is again this is one of the typical form of a kind of granaries in Uttarakhand. 
in the hill regions, these are some of the Uttarakhand granaries. So what they do is, because they have to store the grains for the rest of the year, for six to four months. So what they do is, they once you go in, it's a very small opening. So once they go inside, they have under a little down into it, they have a, a room sort of thing, and then they store all the grains. So you can see how the modern developments are happening, and in the similar way. Now this is one classic example. Here, this particular houses, uh, you can find many of these houses here and there. Uh, because they're gradually getting abandoned because some of the families have migrated down and who owns it and what to do with it no one knows so everywhere in Uttarakhand when you travel you can see all these traditional houses which have done with the rich timber buildings are unmaintained and uh, no one is having an idea how we can retrofit this how we can requalify this for new uses so Similarly, you can see the kind of work, the craftsmanship, the craftsmanship, how they have detailed it out and very with a, a simple understanding what they need. And that is near Harsil and uh, further down, you can also find in places of uh, Koti Banal uh, of even a seven to eight storied buildings of a multi-storied buildings built with stone and timber which is using the Katkuni styles and so you can see the bands of alternate bands of timber stone timber stone and sometimes you can even find seven to eight stories of building a group of houses of a court this is what they refer as kind of koti banal style so you will find a village of uh, because that uh, hilly area, you will find that series of houses in that same passion. You can see here. And in fact, you will be surprised to see how many rooms inside are there. I have seen at least, I have visited about 28 rooms in one building, small, 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 small rooms, and they have multiple aspects. Sometimes it is one big family who will be living and how they are functioning. It itself is a very interesting to understand how they use these spaces in what period of the year and what gender use the space. Like one good example, this is about this one long house, you see about, about more than 28 rooms within it. So here, well, this is a side section of it. It's not like there's a vertical transition. And then in the bottom part, they have for animals. So what you can, they have the cattle, they have the grass, so that makes them also warm, you know, having the animals in the ground floor areas. And similarly, the religious aspects of it, uh, any temples, you find a typical temples of this uh, Barkot region. This is near, uh, it's uh, near Barkot. Uh, it's called uh, Ponti village. So here the, the Badrakali temple is, you can see the kind of technology they've used and the joints. This is the timber and the stone bands and how it is overlaid one other and the whole temple structure and this is the very common style which you will find in this region and which might have survived many earthquakes and till now uh, these are the symbolic aspects of that particular communities and again the granaries which I told you so some of the granaries so but inside the homes also they have some of the granaries like for example if you look at the scale it is almost uh, about two and a half to three feet height so you can see a person is bending and going and uh, once you go inside you'll see the granary the storage areas you know com completely coupled up with the wooden battens and it keeps the you know the necessary items in in without spoiling them during winter or in the summer now uh, after the earthquake and the floods, there are a lot of recent modifications which are happening in this region, especially the new buildings are coming and the old buildings are abandoned. So at the same time, on one side they are abandoning these old buildings, and but during the winter, I have seen people using the same buildings because it makes them warm, like a good example of this. So in earthquake, this particular facade has fallen like this, and then they built another one but in this case, what they're doing is, you can see they are cooking, they are using this space even now, right? So in winter, they are even sleeping there. So despite of uh, having a modern uh, interventions in their uh, places, but still these old buildings, so it becomes a kind of double house concept. 
and similarly here so still this particular sometimes the old people they are using still using these places and the younger generation started using here because of certain modernity and modern impressions which they are thinking of but ideally for a climatic uh, reason this is much more sensitive to the climate but now much more in advance so we have still we have seen an adaptation one is an abandoned version of it and one is a seasonal version of it and the third one is uh, side by side you have a double house concept you know you are using this and that but you see a completely which is irrelevant of what they have lived so these are somewhere near karadi village in amunotri and uh, you can see after the disaster they migrated somewhere and they built completely new uh, which has nothing to do with uh, because the style the, the living style also have gradually changing and they believe that this is a kind of uh, durable uh, nature and the problem of all these uh, why we are trying to ignore these traditional technologies one legally first of all there is a legal restriction because uh, the moment uh, the forest regulation acts have a control uh, with your access obviously that is one limitation the second limitation is availability of craftsmen who will does all the craftsmen it is more expensive to build a timber home now rather than building a brick and concrete home is much more easier and much more exp least expensive so people are going for that so and the other thing is how, any other, how are the uh, building codes or any other codes uh, the structural codes how are they categorizing these indigenous techniques so that is where i think the central building research institute in india they are also doing on validation of these traditional technologies especially with the ministry of rural development so in the same process i can show you some good examples of especially the dajji constructions and where the pakistan government is working on a guidebook for technicians and artisans how to do a dajji construction what are the technicalities involved in it you know how we can qualify these traditional technologies into the uh, the code process and how we can make it them eligible so then that is one way only we can bring these traditions back into the modern times in the present context thank you very much